Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, I'd like to welcome Dr. Stanley Shin. Some of you know Dr. Shin from Hep C ECHO. This is the first time Dr. Shin's given a talk for us. Uh, so thank you, Stanley, for coming. And Dr. Shin's going to talk about bipolar disorder and HIV today. Yeah, uh, so most of this will actually be bipolar disorder, um, but I, I will um, touch base briefly with um, uh, you guys on um, the connections between bipolar disorder and HIV and how that impacts care. Just to summarize, I'll talk about some uh, misconceptions um, that a lot of providers uh, have about bipolar disorder, um, changes with DSM-5, uh, things to be aware of uh, before you prescribe an antidepressant for what looks like garden variety depression, uh, screening instruments like the MDQ, um, briefly, we'll talk about pharmacology and kind of the antidepressant controversy and bipolar disorder, how, might, how one might choose a mood stabilizer, and then um, end with uh, connections uh, between bipolar and HIV. So it's kind of an ambitious agenda, um, but I, I think I can deliver this in kind of the allotted time, so we'll see. Um, this, by the way, is a picture of uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, uh, early 20th century American poet uh, that some people um, speculated uh, may have had bipolar disorder. And in another, another version of this talk that I give, I have some excerpts from her poetry, but um, I don't think we have the time today. You know, I think the thing about bipolar disorder uh, that, that we kind of have stereotypes about in our mind is that this is kind of a can't-miss diagnosis, that you know it when you see it. And the problem actually is that it actually is more often a cult, and um, actually most of bipolar disorder is depression. You know, what we see in Hollywood on um, TV shows or in the movies, uh, the floridly manic patient, um, that's actually a minority of the time. And if it were that easy, um, all of us would be able to do a better job diagnosing bipolar disorder. But it's actually a lot harder than, harder than that. The thing about bipolar disorder also is that people don't always have full mood episodes. So, um, you know, a good 50% of the calendar year, although symptomatic, um, is typically subsyndromal. Uh, where you might just have a few symptoms and not enough to actually qualify you for a full manic episode or a full depressive episode. And if we look at ratios of uh, time spent while symptomatic, relatively depressed versus relatively manic, um, even in bipolar 1, which is characterized by manic episodes, uh, that ratio is 3 to 1 uh, in favor of depression. And in bipolar 2, a much staggeringly larger number of 39 to 1. Um, and, and that 1 is not manic, but, but hypomanic, um, or kind of uh, shading uh, towards hypomanic. And so um, you can see, for instance, in, in these pie charts, and especially the one for bipolar 2, why someone might make a mistake and actually diagnose depression instead of bipolar 2. And even a trained psychiatrist, uh, it, it may take five or ten years before we correct ourselves and, and refine the diagnosis and revise it to bipolar because they've had, for instance, their first hypomanic or their first manic episode. And this longitudinal data, by the way, comes from 13 years of observation of patients and their natural histories. Um, so these were really um, very uh, well esteemed and, and celebrated uh, studies. With uh, DSM-5, one of the most important changes that occurred um, is that for criterion A, it's actually not sufficient to uh, have uh, just the elevated or the irritable mood, uh, but you actually have to have higher energy. Um, so they're trying to make this a more stringent diagnosis now compared to within DSM-4. And it's a little bit awkward because when you go through dig fast, which is criterion B, um, we kind of count higher energy twice um, because there's this requirement for increased goal-directed activity. Um, but that is, uh, for whatever reason, the way it is structured right now. So uh, you have to have um, anywhere from four days, uh, if we're talking about bipolar 2, to a minimum of one week uh, for this altered mood and energy. And then on top of that, you need to go through the rest of the symptom list here. Um, I tend to focus on the symptoms that are in yellow uh, because these are easier to ask about. Um, you know, for instance, if someone tells you that they've got flight of ideas or they're, they're racing, their thoughts are racing and they're speaking like this, you know, it's not a very convincing case, right? And so um, the symptoms that I haven't highlighted um, are sometimes uh, things that I glean more by mental status exam than by directly questioning about this, unless we're exploring past episodes. So the other things that you want to do um, when you're um, kind of sussing out bipolar versus garden variety depression, 
uh, is you do want to ask about some additional context. And so family history is important to ask about. Has anyone in your family ever had bipolar disorder? And if you hear that the answer is yes, I think that changes your threshold for prescribing an antidepressant. You probably want to get more uh, history then. Um, social history uh, is really good to get. And I don't mean just asking about drugs and alcohol, but I mean what's your job? Um, what other jobs have you held in the last year? Uh, if you find out your patient has been hopping cities, uh, you know, five or six cities in the last one or two years, that should raise your eyebrows and make you wonder, is, is this turnover because of bipolar disorder, because of mania? And similarly for relationships. And then um, kind of the, the wolf in sheep's clothing here, atypical features. So um, there is a category of depressive episode that we say has atypical features. So reverse vegetative symptoms, uh, mood reactivity, that means they can brighten temporarily in response to a positive development, um, interpersonal rejection sensitivity. These are what we call atypical depression, and there tends to be an overrepresentation of bipolar disorder um, among this subpopulation of patients with depressed episodes like this. So these are good things to also explore. So uh, as we talked about, there were these changes in DSM-5 so that now we have to have the, the higher energy uh, definitively. Um, the difference between manic and hypomanic episodes is basically one of functional impairment. And, you know, it's true that we have the difference in minimum duration of four days versus one week, although that one week is actually soft. So if someone crashes their car into the front of Whole Foods Market and gets an inpatient psychiatry bed, it doesn't really matter what the duration is. One day is enough. You would still call it a manic episode. Hypomanic episodes, though, by definition, are not functionally impairing. And if you have psychosis because that is functionally impairing, um, you have a manic episode. It's no longer hypomanic. We also got rid of mixed episodes in DSM-5. And so what we have now is mixed features, which can char characterize a manic or hypomanic or a depressive episode. And it's when you have three symptoms from the opposite pole at the same time. And it's kind of a hard concept to, to get your head around because it's a little bit of an oxymoron to think of someone as depressed and manic at the same time. But I think a good way to think about this is unpleasantly activated, a dysphoric activation or a really irritable depression. A lot of these questions are really hard to remember uh, to ask, and so it's really good to just use a, a structured instrument. And, and one of the ones that I would recommend is the MDQ, or the Mood Disorder Questionnaire, which you can just Google for, MDQ and PDF, and you can download this. It asks a lot of questions, um, and basically, uh, when you have seven symptom endorsements under question number one, it's a positive screen. But the important thing to know about the MDQ is that a positive screen is not a bipolar diagnosis because this will overcall bipolar disorder by a factor of two to three, which is huge. It's a very huge false positive rate. But the reason this instrument is useful is because a negative screen is a definitive rule out. Okay? It's 96, 97% accurate uh, when it's a negative result. So uh, let's say that uh, you're convinced you've got a bipolar patient. What about antidepressants if they happen to be depressed? And you know, even when I was in medical school, uh, you know, it was standard of practice to, to go ahead and prescribe antidepressants for when they were depressed. But actually, uh, this study, um, STEP-BD, which is kind of like the equivalent of STARDI, but for bipolar, um, found uh, quite surprisingly that if you took bipolar ones and twos who were depressed, and put them on an antidepressant plus mood stabilizer, that did not actually outperform placebo plus mood stabilizer. And so um, this kind of really shook up uh, our practice. And, and basically, we uh, no longer recommend using an antidepressant um, in this way. Um, the other interesting uh, finding in this study was manic switch, which um, the rates were identical between placebo and antidepressant. But we have to remember mood stabilizer was always present. And, they didn't have an arm here with unopposed antidepressant. Okay. Now, later on, I'm going to show you a table where there actually is one indication for an antidepressant, but it's with a very specific antipsychotic. And it's important to recognize that antipsychotics were actually not well represented in this New England Journal paper because that only constituted 15% of the study population here, whereas the other 85% were lithium and, and Depakote. So how do you choose a mood stabilizer if you've got a bipolar uh, depressed patient uh, or, or manic? Um, really, the, the first question is, what is my patient right now? Are they doing well? Are they depressed? Are they manic? 
Uh, if you're looking at maintenance, you want to know what is the preponderance of past episodes. Have they mostly had problems with mania or with depression? And then you want to weigh cost and side effects and comorbidities. So um, it's a complex table here, but um, there are a few things that I think are worth committing to memory. Um, there, there are too many X's to commit to memory. So what I tend to do uh, is I actually fo first think about bipolar depression. It's pretty easy to remember the three that work for this. Okay? And then for bipolar mania, I think of the three that don't work. And, and I think if you remember that, um, uh, I, I think that uh, what I'm trying to convey um, will we'll get across, and, and I think that patient outcomes will be a lot better. And, you know, I think that when we think about bipolar disorder, a lot of times you think, well, I'll just refer to the psychiatrist. But we have to remember that two-thirds of depression is actually treated in primary care. And I would not be surprised if a similarly large percentage of bipolar actually never gets to psychiatry because the fact is that um, when we have mental health clinic on our sign, uh, on our clinic door, it's very stigmatizing. And so a lot of our patients uh, never get to us. And so this will fall into a lot of your laps regardless. Um, so for bipolar depression, uh, you have to remember that it's antipsychotics that work. Um, lithium and lamictal only have an effect when you look at large meta-analyses, and it's a much more modest benefit. Um, but for an acute bipolar depression episode, you actually want to use Lutuda, lorazidone, olanzapine, fluoxetine, that's the magic combination, and quetiapine. This kind of raises questions about, well, can I generalize to other atypical SSRI combinations? And the answer is no, uh, because someone tried Risperdal Paxil, for instance, and that did not work. Abilify failed, Geodon failed uh, for monotherapy. And so for whatever reason, that, that combination works. For bipolar mania, Lamictal uh, is, it kind of has this funny niche that it occupies. It, it's FDA approved for bipolar maintenance, uh, but really is good at preventing depression episodes, which is most of bipolar, but not at rescuing uh, acute mania. Uh, lorazidone, I don't know why this X is not filled in, uh, but it's either that the trial failed or they just haven't tested this yet, so it's not really a reliable uh, instrument at this time. And then the olanzapine fluoxetine is excluded because if someone's manic, you probably don't want the SSRI, SSRI around. And then for maintenance, uh, these are the four that really have the best track record and, and the formal FDA approvals. And adjunct is adjunct to lithium or to Depakote. Oftentimes, when we're faced with an acutely manic patient, we're wondering, do we do lithium or Depakote? Uh, because we don't necessarily want to go right to the atypical antipsychotic. Um, and if you're thinking about, uh, for instance, this choice for a young female patient, I would recommend probably never using Depakote um, unless reproduction is not a concern. And it's not just about the higher uh, rate of teratogenicity, which is about 6 to 10 percent with Depakote, absolute risk, um, but it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so you can permanently damage a young woman's ability to have children in the future. And so this is why um, you would probably lean towards lithium, uh, if possible, as opposed to Depakote. So um, I'm just going to wrap up here as far as bipolar disorder and HIV. Uh, some things to be aware of, and, and this is not terribly surprising, is that medication adherence is worse uh, when HIV patients have uh, bipolar disorder. Graphs here, um, I believe, reflect this is self-report, and I think this is when you have pharmacy monitoring reports. So you can see that self-report is not very reliable, um, and so calling the pharmacy to see if the refills are picked up in a timely fashion may be an important thing to do. And then interestingly, uh, medication adherence is worse uh, for psychiatric medications uh, than it is for uh, antiretroviral adherence, but both are impacted. There's also uh, the issue of riskier behaviors. Um, uh, so, for instance, unprotected sex. There's a higher rate of this in HIV patients with bipolar versus HIV patients without bipolar. And again, that, that's relatively intuitive, but something to, to also keep in mind. The t key take-home points today are basically, first of all, most of bipolar disorder is depression. And so I would not be overly confident when you have a depressed patient and, and reach for the prescription pad and, and automatically write out the uh, prescription for the SSRI. I would do a little more screening for bipolar disorder, whether that's the MDQ or asking about additional questions like social history and uh, also family history. You should always screen and, if possible, um, contact family or, or other providers because they may have additional context that the patient um, is not very self-aware of. The MDQ is a good instrument, but 
relatively useless when it's a positive, um, really more effective when it's a rule out and, and then the screen's negative. Uh, you want to be very careful about antidepressant use in bipolar disorder. Um, generally, there really is not a good evidence base for this. And when you're prescribing uh, medications for bipolar disorder, you want to be mindful of where is your patient at that day, and then what does the trail look like behind uh, where they are right now. So what's their history look like mostly? Is it 50-50? Is it 3-1? Is it 39-1? to one? And this can help guide uh, what you're going to pick. Please do not prescribe Depakote to any young female patients uh, who want to have children. Uh, finally, uh, untreated bipolar disorder can undermine uh, uh, HIV health outcomes, and so something extra to, to track and keep on your radar.